As we get into this chapter on Congress, it's somewhat amusing to begin by looking at Americans' love-hate relationship with this institution. Compared to the Supreme Court and the President, Americans are more likely to be angry at members of Congress, disgusted by members of Congress, least likely to be proud of members of Congress, as evidenced by the graph in the upper left-hand corner of the screen. If you look at the graph on the bottom, this shows survey respondents in terms of how they would rate the honesty and ethical standards of people in all these different fields. If you look at senators, only 12% of Americans rate them with high honesty and ethical standards, and only 9% of Americans rate members of Congress, members of the House, with high honesty and ethical standards. That's just just above car salesmen. So this kind of paints a picture of Americans' perception of Congress as not being very positive. However, when you look at how much Americans approve of their own representative, you see it's very high as, as evidenced by the chart in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. So the blue line represents the respondent's approval of his or her own member of Congress. The red line represents approval of Congress as a whole. And you see that there's a pretty big gap there. As of today, about 21% of Americans approve of the way Congress is handling its job. That's according to polling averages by RealClearPolitics.com. So you may think with these approval ratings in the dumps that members of Congress have a very shaky political future ahead of them, that their chances for re-election might be slim. However, what we find is that when members of Congress are elected, they are very successful at getting re-elected. This is what we call in political science the incumbent advantage. So an incumbent very simply is someone who already holds elective office and is running for re-election. And what we find is that all other things being equal, and when I say that I mean absent any scandal or corruption or huge missteps while in office, current members of Congress will get a larger share of the vote come re-election time simply because they're already in office. This slide shows you the re-election rates of members of Congress going back to 1964. And you can see that in a, a typical election year, members of the House are re-elected in rates of over 90%. Now, re-election rates in the Senate are a little bit lower. That could be due to the fact that senators go up for re-election every six years. Maybe they get a little far farther removed from their constituents than members of the House who are re-elected every two years. However, even in the Senate, re-election rates are typically over 80%. So how do we explain this? Why are members of Congress so good at getting themselves re-elected? Well, a lot of it has to do with the fact that Congress is designed to benefit its existing members. Keep in mind that members of Congress have control over public policy, right? Those are the rules for society and how we allocate our scarce resources. They can establish rules and allocate resources in such a way that benefits them and facilitates their reelection chances. Let's look at how. First of all, when it comes to advertising, incumbents seek visibility among their constituents. Remember, constituents are the people that a member of Congress is representing. We would call those the people back home that live in the, the district. Members of Congress want to be in the forefront of people's mind. This is so important to members of Congress because a lot of people, when they get into the voting booth and they look at a list of names of all the candidates running for a U.S. House seat, for example, and they may not know anything about any of the candidates running, but there's one of the name in the list that jumps out at them. There's one name that they recognize above the others. And even though they may not know anything about that person, they will vote for him or her simply because they recognize the name. And members of Congress are very good at making sure their name is the one that people recognize. They do this by taking advantage of what's called the franking privilege. This is when members of Congress can send mail back to their districts at the taxpayer expense. Keep in mind that they're not sending blatant campaign literature that says vote for me on November 6th, for example, but they are sending newsletters and updates to the people back home. Of course, front and center on these newsletters is the congressman's name and his or her picture. When you think about every district having about 710,000 people, that's going to be a pretty big price tag for the postage that is required to send these mailers out to households in a member of Congress's district. Also, members of Congress 
Congress don't have to pay for the printing of these newsletters to send back to their constituents. So this really helps members of Congress advertise and promote themselves to their constituents. Also keep in mind that a member of Congress has a paid staff. Representatives in the House have an, on average, they're going to employ about 30 people. Senators have anywhere between two and four million dollars to spend on staff depending on the population of their state and they're going to on average employ about 50 people. This is a big advantage that a current member of Congress has over any potential challenger who's going to be relying on volunteers. Not to mention that members of Congress get free flights home, a office space, a recording studio, all of this that a challenger would have to pay for. And of course the media is always clamoring to interview members of Congress. Uh, anytime there's a development on the national level, they get their name all over the newspapers and all over local TV stations. This, again, helps increase the visibility of the incumbent. Members of Congress can also take credit for their service while in office. They can take credit for voting in line with the interests of their constituents. They have a proven track record, and sometimes it's been said that in politics and voting, it's more about the devil you know versus the devil you don't know. And even though some people may have qualms about their existing senator or congressperson, he or she is a known commodity. Tying this into chapter 10 on interest groups, keep in mind also that interest groups will oftentimes rate members of Congress and according to how frequently that representative voted with the interests of the group. And so these ratings are something that a an incumbent can take credit for when running for re-election. They might go before their constituents and say, hey, I know that gun rights are important to you and I have a 100% A-plus rating with the National Rifle Association voting in line with their wishes and values. Also in Chapter 10, we saw how much the average candidate spent running for office for U.S. House races, U.S. Senate races, the presidency. And what we can see in this chapter is that incumbents raise a lot more money than potential challengers. That's indicated by this slide right here where you'll see in 2018, House incumbents raised more than four times their challengers and Senate incumbents raised more than seven times their challengers. So potential donors to a campaign, they see their contribution as an investment and they know that they're much more likely to get a return on that investment if they donate to an incumbent who's most likely going to get reelected than a potential challenger. And also keep in mind that as much as 70% of the time that uh, members of the House and Senate are in office, they're actually raising money, piling up what's called a war chest, just a stockpile of campaign funds to use in the next election. All of this works to their advantage and actually scares off any potential challengers. Lastly, members of Congress are going to take credit for servicing their constituents while in office. This really comes in two forms. First, pork barrel legislation. This is money from the federal treasury that a member of Congress secures for a special project back home. These projects are oftentimes inserted into big spending bills. We sometimes call these omnibus spending bills. Sometimes they don't even go through the typical legislative process. They're inserted sort of in the dead of night, but they allow members of Congress to take credit for special projects back home. For example, uh, in 2009, Congress passed this big $410 billion spending bill. And if you go through that bill with a fine tooth comb, you'll find funding for over 9,000 projects that members of Congress in each of the 50 states secured for the people back home. For example, in that bill, you would find $485,000 for a boarding school for at-risk Native students in Western Alaska. You'd find $1.2 million to provide eyeglasses for students with poor vision. Uh, more close to home, we saw that um, Senator Carl Levin, when he was in office, was able to secure $22 million for a cruise ship and ferry terminal in Detroit. This was all made possible through these pork barrel projects. Now, as a whole, Americans look at these projects and we see it as wasteful government spending. But we sure don't complain when it shows up on our doorstep. In fact, it gives members of Congress something that they can take credit for in going up for re-election. Lastly, members of Congress are going 
going to take credit for casework. This is actually really useful to keep in mind if you ever have a problem with a government agency or department and you just feel like they're giving you the runaround. Uh, let's say, for example, that you are a veteran and you know that you're eligible for certain health care benefits and you're just getting the runaround with a VA hospital. You can call up your member of Congress and tell them the problem that you're having. That member of Congress can get on the phone with the affairs and pull some strings for you and help you get your problem solved. Members of Congress are oftentimes much more successful in getting results from government agencies and departments because, well, frankly, they set the budgets for each of those government departments and agencies. And if members of Congress come to believe that these government agencies are not serving the American people well, then they can open up hearings and start investigating and ultimately maybe even cut their funding. So, these agencies are very responsive when a member of Congress or a member of their staff calls them up and asks them to get to the bottom of a problem that a citizen is having. So this slide gives you an example of your grandma's social security check doesn't come and she relies on this every month to pay her bills. Well, she can call up her member of Congress and he or she can track it down with the social security administration or more likely a member of his or her staff will call up to social security administration and, and help your grandma ch track down her her check. And what this does, it gains a positive rapport among a member of Congress's constituents and your grandma will go around and tell all of her friends, you know, what a wonderful representative she has. And this overall just garners a lot of goodwill and um, creates a positive reputation for a member of Congress that helps his or her re-election chances. With all of these advantages that incumbents have over potential challengers, the question often becomes, should members of Congress be term limited? Right now, members of the House serve for two-year terms, and as long as they can get their constituents to re-elect them, they can serve an unlimited number of terms. In fact, a representative from Michigan who um, just recently died, actually, John Dingell, holds the record for the longest years of consecutive service in the U.S. House, and he served for more than 59 years.